on the virtual Bible study tonight. We've got a very important discussion, and we're looking forward to it. We've been talking for the last several weeks about a, a mini-debate on the instrumental music question. We think it's so important, and there's a lot of interest. It's a question we discuss a lot. Unfortunately, there's disagreement about this question in the religious world. We've got two good men who are going to discuss that with us tonight in a sort of a mini-debate format, Jacob. All right, it's going to be a great discussion, going to be a great hour, and we're going to get started right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 Three one three eight one four five six seven, or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com. We hope you'll take out your Bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of God's Word on this edition of the Virtual Bible Study. And we welcome you to the Virtual Bible Study for Thursday, May 9th, 2018. Welcome to the program tonight. 2019. 19. Yeah. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is here. Hello. Jacob, there. great to be with you Kyle's tonight. behind the controls tonight. Glad, glad that Kyle's here, but... More importantly, we've got two special guests for an important discussion on instrumental music. For several weeks we've been planning this, and we've got two men who've been very gracious to cooperate and join us on the Virtual Bible Study. Kent Bailey, uh, you often hear us mention his name on the Virtual Bible Study. He frequently emails us, has, has even joined us by telephone in the past on the Virtual Bible Study. Kent preaches for the Northside Church, in Cal Church of Christ in Calhoun, Georgia. Kent, welcome to the Virtual Bible Study. Thank you. It's good to be here. And then we have a, a new friend that we have not met before, uh, Bob Roberson, who, I, if I've got this right, Bob, you're with the Central Christian Church in Jonesboro, Tennessee. That is correct. Correct. All right. So up in Upper East Tennessee, Bob's in Upper East Tennessee tonight. We thank you both for uh, your interest in Bible study. And that's what we think this is. We, we've used the expression debate, many debate. Uh, Sometimes that carries a negative connotation for people. We don't mean for it to be that way. It's just a Bible study, and we think this is a good way to thoroughly investigate a, an important question. We're going to be limited on time. Our format tonight is going to be this way. Kent, you're going to go first for 15 minutes making your affirmative arguments. You'll be arguing that we should not. I'll let you state your position, but you'll be arguing that we should not use instrumental music in New Testament worship. You'll have 15 minutes. Immediately following you, Bob, you'll have 15 minutes to give your affirmative arguments, and, and your position will be, effectively, that you believe that we sh can use instrumental music in New Testament worship, and you'll be presenting your affirmative arguments. After that, each man in the same order will have 10 minutes to review, respond to the, to the arguments the other has made, and that will leave us with just a, a few minutes at the very end. Maybe Jacob and I can throw some darts at you right at the end of the program. All right, and I, I know both uh, Bob and Kent uh, agree with this statement, but there's not going to be a winner or a loser tonight. This isn't a contest. This is a Bible study, and so the only the only winner is going to be truth. Yeah, as we as we examine what the scriptures teach. Jake, you and I have a friend who, when he he loves to engage in debates, but he says, you know, at the end of the debate, when you go home after you had a Bible study with someone, your wife doesn't ask you who won the Bible study. Yep. You know, there's no winners and losers in the Bible study. Truth wins by open investigation, and so that's what we're looking for tonight. All right. Well, without further delay, we we're going to be short on time, so let's go ahead and get started, and we'll go with you, Kent. We're going to give you 15 minutes to present your position uh, that the Bible does not authorize instrumental music in worship today, and as a result, uh, such would be sinful. Thank you. It's good to be here. I appreciate Bob and his willingness to participate in this Bible study. And as we've already said, we're, this is not a personal contest between Bob and between me. I consider Bob a friend, though we've talked on the phone and we've uh, I've maybe had an email exchange or two we haven't personally met. It's good to see you tonight, Bob. And you are better looking than I am. I'll give you credit to that for credit. For that. <laughs> but it's good to have him. It's good to have him be a participant. And I'm appreciative for the College View Church. And they're making provision for this period of intense Bible study. Bob and I are not going to be casting insults at one another. We're not going to be trying to gouge each other's eyes out. We're going to simply have a gentlemanly discussion of what the Bible teaches. Now, that's not saying that we agree. Obviously, we do not agree. And that's not saying that we should not press our point. Certainly we should, 
but we can do it in a gentlemanly way, and we can do it in a very kind way. We can do it in a way that will be beneficial to all of us in the study of the Word of God. If you'll note the very first chart, my introductory slide introducing my material, uh, pull that up, John chapter 4, uh, verses 20 to 24. Uh, we'll note that Jesus says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If we understand what Jesus says in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, we see that it's important that we worship the correct being, that we worship God. And then it's also important that we worship God with the right attitude, that we worship God in spirit. And according to John chapter 23, or chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, we must worship God according to truth. That is, in accordance with the truth God has revealed in the New Testament of Christ. It's my conviction, and it's my contention this evening, that the use of mechanical instruments of music in worship to God are unauthorized. It's my conviction that the scriptures authorize only that of singing exclusively and nothing more, nothing less, or nothing else. If you'll notice chart number one, uh, I'm introducing a logical argument at this time, and the argument is stated thusly, the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship to God is right only if their use is authorized by the New Testament. Their use is not authorized by the New Testament. Therefore, the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship to God is not right. Such is sinful. Now, this, from a mechanical standpoint, and from a, a logical standpoint as the way the structure, this is a valid argument. It's known as a modus tollens argument. Now, what my obligation will be, and I only have time for one argument this evening because of the, the, the time constraints on us, my responsibility is to prove the validity and the truthfulness of premise one and premise, tr premise two. You know, people can introduce arguments that are valid, but if they cannot prove the soundness or the, the truthfulness of the major and the minor, minor premise, that would mean that the argument does not stand. It, it would not be proven. And so what I want to do tonight is look at the, the major premise and look at the minor premise and we'll be going on and looking at uh, various evidences regarding the major premise and the minor premise. And if I can uh, prove both premises, then the conclusion will follow. First of all, let's note this evening chart number two as we look at some scriptural evidence regarding this major premise. And, of course, when we talk about the major premise, the major premise is the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship to God is right only if their use is authorized by the New Testament. Consider, if you would, with me, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. And here Paul writes, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. If you'll note the word whatsoever, and if you'll note the word all, that certainly would uh, include worship unto God. In fact, everything we do in life needs to have Bible authority. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we practice needs to have Bible authority. Now let's go to chart number three at this time, if you would, please. There's only two types of authority in the Bible. One type of authority would be general, and the other type would be specific. Let's take some time to look at the concept of general or generic authority. When we talk about general or generic authority, we're talking about authority having no specific quality or application. A good illustration of that is found over in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, where Jesus is giving his instruction to his followers before he returns to heaven. And he tells them in verse 15, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole of creation. Then he says in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Now, if you'll note the very first part when he talks about going, he gives no specificity regarding that of going. In fact, uh, he leaves that to human judgment. It's very general. You know, and as long as a person uses biblical ethics in the way they travel, as long as they travel in a legal way, that could encompass many areas insofar as our traveling, whether it be walking or riding a motor scooter or riding a donkey or a camel or riding an automobile, an SUV of an airplane, what have you could even go by means of computer like what we're doing tonight. 
and that would be a means of, of going. But when you look at the latter part of this verse, we're to go into all the world and we're, we're to preach the gospel, that's very specific. And when we talk about specific authority, we're talking about having specifiable category. I'd like for us to make an application of that regarding that concerning instrumental music and concerning singing. When we look at the New Testament of Christ, nowhere in the New Testament is there authority for an action of worship that lacks specifiable category. In fact, uh, Bob and I have never talked about that, and I really don't know what he's going to have to say. I'm interested in listening to what he has to say, and I will give him a fair hearing. But it, even if we go back into the Old Testament, if we look at patriarchy, uh, when it comes to worship, if we look at the covenant of Moses, God in the word of God has always required specificity. He's given a specific detail insofar how he has indeed wanted people to worship him. And so when it comes to New Testament authority, as it relates to worship as a whole, I would maintain this evening that nowhere in the New Testament is there authority for an act of worship that lacks specifiable category. We need to have specific detail on how God wants us to worship. Now that brings us to chart number four. And chart number four deals with how we go about ascertaining New Testament authority. And we do that in three different ways. We do it by explicit statements, including commands. We accomplish that by examples. We accomplish that by means of implication. Uh, someone may say, well, that's a religious formula. Well, we do make a religious application of that. We make a New Testament application of such. But that within and of itself is not simply limited to the study of the Bible. In fact, the Bible is addressed to us in human language. And because the Bible is addressed to us in human language, the New Testament in particular, as well as the Old Testament, God uses various uh, means of language and thinking in order for us to understand the Bible. And so when it comes to studying anything, whether it be the Bible, whether it be a newspaper, whether it be a classic, whether it be a, a textbook, we all have to use statements, examples, and implications in the study of such written literature. Why? Because we have to reason from it and we want to draw proper conclusions from it. And if we don't draw, draw proper conclusions from it, we're going to miss the whole point of looking at what we're wanting to see and what truth we're wanting to ascertain as a result of reading that particular written literature. And the same thing would be true with reference to that of uh, spoken words as listening to a sermon, a lecture, a Bible class, or what have you. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about an explicit statement? I can give you an illustration from that in Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, there's no explicit statement saying that it's sinful to baptize a baby, but yet I wouldn't be willing to go that far. I've never talked to Bob about his convictions about that, but I think perhaps Bob would agree with me on that. Neither one of us would be willing to, perf to perform practice infant baptism. Also consider Acts chapter 2 and verse Verse 38, where Peter said, Repent ye, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe Bob or I would be willing, I know I wouldn't, and I don't believe Bob would either to be willing to baptize a person who was unwilling to repent of their sins. Yet there's no explicit statement that says it would be wrong to baptize an impenitent individual, even though they would be a believer. And so we wouldn't baptize babies, we wouldn't baptize atheists, we wouldn't baptize agnostics. Why? Because people are not qualified because they lack faith. Five and when we understand there, explicit language, and when we understand how explicit authority yeah. or explicit language, explicit statements are exclusive in their natures, we do not have to find an explicit prohibition to understand, understand an explicit statement on how the Bible teaches. Kent, uh, five minutes, Kent. Okay, we find that as we go further, that uh, the Bible authorizes itself, and it's, it's, we find that the, the principle illustrated in chart number five, that the world, as it orders things from Amazon, if I order a pair of, if I want a, a black dress belt, I, you know, that's very specific information. Would Amazon, if I ordered a black dress belt, send me a pair of black dress shoes? No, he wouldn't. They wouldn't. The specific authority is exclusive in nature. The, the black dress belt would automatically 
exclude a pair of black shoes. I would have to specify that I wanted that. Okay, let's go on to our next chart. In chart number six, what does the Bible authorize insofar as the type of music that God wants in the church? Notice, if you would, Romans 15 and verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Look at Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are of one for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. In James 5, 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him praise any Mary, let him sing psalms. Now, oftentimes the Greek language comes into play when it comes to the verb solo and the noun salmos. And oftentimes it's been argued by those who believe in the use of mechanical instruments of music that the word solo is inclusive of instrumental music. And while certainly the word solo can mean more than sing, it can mean twitch, twang, or pluck, in some cases we find, especially in the Old Testament Greek Septuagint version, it means sing to the tune of a harp, but how is it used in the New Testament? There, in his lexicon says in the New Testament, the word solo means to sing a hymn, to celebrate the praises of God in song. The analytical Greek lexicon says in the New Testament, sing praises. Moulton and Milligan says in the New Testament, sing a hymn. Go to the next chart. Green says in the New Testament, it means to sing praises. Dr. Abbott Smith says in the New Testament, sing a hymn to sing praise. The exegetical dictionary of the New Testament says in the New Testament, solo always refers to the song of praise to God. Two minutes. And so we, we, how much time? Two. Two minutes. As we look at the New Testament, we find in looking at the major premise of the argument that I included, the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship to God is right only if their use is authorized by the New Testament. Their use is not authorized by the New Testament, the minor premise, and therefore the conclusion is, therefore, the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship to God is not right, such as sinful. That's my, that's my argument. That's all really the time I have to make. If you look at it from a logical perspective, if you look at it from the perspective of biblical authority, if you look at it from the perspective of the philosophy of language, on what the word solo means, and even salmos means, you see that while those words may mean something other than an instrument or something other than singing in secular contexts, in other contexts, but in the context of the New Testament, the Greek lexicographers uh, defines that as that of singing. I do appreciate your interest. I appreciate your listening. And so I encourage you to give Bob a very patient and a honorable and a very careful listening as he presents a rebuttal to this material. All right. Thank you, Kent, for that. And, uh, Bob, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and start your time. Uh, you tell me when. I am ready now. Thank you All very right. much. Go. Uh, and, Kent, I appreciate your comments. And, gentlemen, I appreciate the opportunity I have to be here tonight. I love studying the Bible it's probably one of my great passions. I wish I had more time to do it. Uh, if you'd put up my first slide there, please. And, uh, that's my name, email address, and telephone number. As Kent has already let us know, there's no way in the world we're gonna cover this subject in just the time we have this evening. And I apologize for the train that's going on behind me. If you're <laughs> I hope it doesn't up. run over you, Bob. It sounds pretty loud. It comes pretty close. Uh, <laughs> But I invite those who are watching this program, and Kent, you as well, and anybody else who might watch this later, to feel free to send me an email or give me a telephone call, and I'll be more than happy to give you more information and talk to you about why I believe what I do. Uh, but again, we're just not going to be able to do that all today. Uh, but please feel free to do that if you would like to do that. And Greg or Jacob, if someone calls your station, you have my permission to give them that information if you hang on to that slide and have that information to give them. Absolutely, thank you. Kent, I appreciate your thought that the primary issue we have is authority. 
and I agree with you that that's true. And probably the one thing that breaks my heart the most is the fact that so many of our churches don't get along with each other and, and read the Bible differently and, and argue and, and scrape over uh, how we're going to understand the Bible. And uh, a little bit about me, uh, while I am a minister now in a Christian church, which of course uses instruments, at least most of them do, uh, I'm a fifth generation uh, Church of Christ, a cappella, non-instrumental church person. Uh, my great-grandfather was in the non-instrumental church Christ, as were my grandparents and my parents, uh, in-laws on my wife's side. Uh, my children, of course, went there for a long time while we attended there before, until we left and joined the Christian church. Uh, authority is one of the things that we do talk about a lot. And if you would put slide number seven on, uh, this is something that probably causes a lot of issue on what is the authority and who gets to decide what does the Bible say. And, and I'm not going to uh, go into all these things, but if anyone watching this has been in the Church of Christ very long, you know that sadly the, the Church of Christ is divided over all kinds of things. Uh, can we have kitchens or not? Uh, can we have one cup for the Lord's Supper or not? Uh, can we use a lot of little bitty cups? Can we use any Bible other than the King James Version? Uh, there are just numerous ways that the churches of Christ are divided. And that's not specific to them. That's true in a lot of, a lot of groups of, of people who profess to be Christians. Uh, but I, I throw that up there simply to say that the struggle is uh, who decides what the authority in the Bible is and how do we determine uh, what does the Bible say as far as the authority goes? Most of the time when we're talking about authority, we take the position that people who are more conservative than us and who want to bind the way they view authority on us are simply misguided. Uh, they misunderstand the Bible. They're not reading it correctly. And Kent, as you mentioned, we've talked on the phone and emailed back and forth. I don't know you very well. I don't know anything about the church you attend, but I presume you know there are some churches who believe you can only use one cup for the Lord's Supper. And they, of course, believe that because they argue that the Bible authorizes nothing but that. And so having many little cups uh, violates a specific example in scripture without any specific authority to allow something different. And many times those of us who might consider ourselves, uh, for lack of a better word, liberal, uh, look at them and think, well, that's not what the Bible means. That's certainly not what the Bible says. But then we turn around and look at those who are more liberal than us. And our usual indication is, well, you're going beyond the authority of the Bible you are not doing what the Bible authorizes. And so almost all of us are somewhere in the middle on that spectrum of how do we understand biblical authority and how narrow do we want to define spirit or biblical authority in order to make it bind us. And as we look at that, um, we find it struggling to get along with people uh, simply because we sent, can't agree on what the biblical authority is. And that's why uh, I love to study scripture. And I appreciate, Kent, your opportunity to let us do this tonight. And Greg, you and Jacob for putting this on. Uh, so the challenge is, and I think, Kent, you've you mentioned it well, uh, do we have any authority to use instrumental music in scripture? Um, uh, let me just quickly run through. Most of us know in the Old Testament, uh, instruments were used widely. Uh, there is many, many examples in the Old Testament of, of instruments being used, God's people using the instrument. Uh, and I understand that's the Old Testament. And I understand that that's not necessarily binding on us. But I also understand if we jump to the end of the New Testament, we get to the book of Revelation, and we find there what appears to be God sitting on his throne and the different angels and others playing instruments and harps and trumpets and other things and God not having any displeasure with that at all. And I again appreciate uh, that some will argue, well, one's Old Testament, we're not under that. The other one's heaven and we're not there yet. So we're sort of limited to what are we going to do now here while we're on the earth and we only have the New Testament to guide us. 
And because we don't have a whole lot of time to get into this thing, uh, I'm going to argue that pretty much there's two primary scriptures, and Kent, you gave them to us, you gave us several, uh, but the primary two is the Ephesians 5 passage and the Ephesians 3 passage that talks about us singing and making melody uh, in our hearts and letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And there are several other passages, as you mentioned, Kent, that use some of those words as well. And I, I believe if if I can use an example, and if you'll pop up for me, Jacob, or whoever's doing the slides, I apologize for not having your name because I'm not sure who's doing this. Uh, if we look at the word baptism, most of us understand that that word is a major source of conflict with different groups of Christians. Uh, some want to sprinkle, some want to pour, some argue that it can only be by immersion, and that is the position I take. I believe the Bible teaches baptism is by immersion. But the challenge is when we read that word baptize or baptism, to most of us who understand English, we don't understand that word without having to go look it up to see what it means. And if we understand our history of the Bible, uh, that word was transliterated as opposed to translated and instead of being translated immersion or dip or bury or some other word like that, which is what it meant, they simply made up a new word called baptize or baptism. And because of that, we have a lot of arguments in the churches today about what does that word mean and how can we do it and how is it supposed to be accomplished. Uh, my argument or position is we struggle because of that, with understanding some of the words Paul uses in the verses that we're talking about. And this is probably going to get a little boring for some of us. I, I love to study and I, I have done an extensive argument or study of what does the words that Paul is using mean. And if you'd pop up my slide number 30, um, and I appreciate the lexicon argument, Kent, but the truth is that none of the words found in the New Testament meant praise God a cappella only. There is no a cappella only word used in the New Testament. So the challenge for us is to take those Greek words and how they are translated and try to determine what are they supposed to mean. And one group uh, sees it as a cappella only. Other Christians see it as a cappella. Pella also we can sing with or without instruments because we believe that's authorized and really the way most of us have been taught uh, sort of colors the way we're willing to look at those words and try to make them fit the way we uh, believe they probably are in reality even in the English language there is no word that means a cappella only when you say sing and if we were at a party or if we were at a concert or if we were anywhere and someone there who was a talented singer and we asked that person, would you get up and sing us a song? I seriously doubt that anybody would object unless we were in a church service where you thought it was wrong. But if we're in a secular setting and you ask someone to get up and sing us a song, no one would complain if that person picked up their guitar or sat down at a piano to sing a song for us. So even in the English language, that word sing doesn't mean sing a cappella. We have to add that uh, into something. The next slide, number 32. Five minutes, five minutes uh, Bob. Thank you. Covers the different words that Paul uses uh, that are used in the Greek to mean either sing or song. And you can see there on that slide, there are three nouns for song and three nouns for scene, and those have been the subject of a lot of arguments, a lot of discussions uh, for a long, long time. Uh, but as we look at some of these, and again, we don't have a lot of time to go in these, and I'd be more than happy to forward my slides uh, to people if you call and ask for them. And I believed, Kent, if you, if I remember correctly, you used uh, Vine, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, and he does talk about in the New Testament, that word means sing a hymn. But if you read the entire definition in Vine, he doesn't limit it to that. 
In fact, he says primarily it means, and this is my slide 46, primarily to twitch, twang, uh, then to play a stringed instrument with your fingers. In the Septuagint, it means to sing with the harp, to sing psalms, to denote in the New Testament, to sing a hymn or to sing praise, and it quotes Ephesians 5.19. And we, if we're not careful, read that very restrictively and say, well, see, Vine is saying you can only sing a hymn. Uh, most of the scholars disagree with that, and what they would argue Vine is actually saying is he's making a distinction between singing hymns and singing any other kind of song. And so what Vine means by when he says to sing a hymn is you sing a praise to God. You're not singing a bar song. You're not singing some rock and roll song. You're not singing some song that has no religious purpose. But instead, you're singing a hymn, but it doesn't leave off the idea that you could sing with an instrument. And all of the other scholars from the New Testament Greek um, English Dictionary, which is my slide 43, the conclusion is that it's widely agreed that the primary meaning in the New Testament is to sing with at least the possible nuance to sing with a musical instrument. Clearly, no conclusion can be drawn solely from the lexical meaning of solo, as to whether instrumental accompaniment should be included with Christian worship and song. In other words, the weight of authority of the experts is all of these words include with it the possibility of playing an instrument while you are singing. And all of them agree, none of them mean sing a cappella only. And it's a real, it's a long study, it's a hard study, and again, it's not something that we can do here. If you would pop up my slide 51. Two minutes. And this one I think is, is interesting. How much time have I got? Two minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Paul uses ode and auto uh, here in these two passages for song and scene. They only occur in the New Testament here and in the Revelation of John. John uses it three times. In John 5, or Revelation 5.9, 14.3 and 15.3, all three instances occur with harps or the sounds of harps being specified in the previous verses. And so when John is writing the Revelation and he uses the very same Greek words that Paul uses, there are people playing instruments. And it, I, I acknowledge that that's in heaven, but I think what's important is he uses the same words. And of course, part of his revelation is to the church at Ephesus, and as he uses the same word Paul uses, it would seem to carry with it the idea that the ode and the auto include the idea that instruments can be played. No one says in the New Testament you cannot use instruments, but the Greek words include with them the understanding that you could use instruments if you wished. And I really think that's probably one of the things we really have to try to understand is how does the Greek use those words and how are they translated and are they translated in such a way that make them restrictive as opposed to optional. In other words, are those words in the Greek and the scholars agree that those words include play or don't play, your choice. Many of them look at it that way. And as you look at it that way, then it gives us the freedom in Christ to sing with an instrument or to sing without an instrument and that's your choice as opposed to a rule or law that somebody should bind on us to try to make it uh, absolute that you cannot have instruments at all. And I'll stop right there. Thank you, Bob. All right. Um, let, we, let us grab a, let's short let's a short break. And, and uh, can't you gear up and be ready to go for 10 minutes to uh, respond to, to Bob's statements? All right. We're going to get a break. Okay, thank you. And we'll get back to the discussion right after this. You won't want to miss what we talk about next. The discussion continues right after these important messages. Hi, I'm Wade Shelton. In 1 Peter 3.15, the scripture says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, we believe here at College View that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us. And I believe that we are dedicated to this cause. That's why we here at College View bring you the virtual Bible study each week. Our hope is that you will join us each week here on the virtual Bible study in hopes of strengthening your faith so that you will be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. 
Please join us here every Thursday night on the Virtual Bible Study. I know that it's worth an hour of your time. I'm James Buchanan from Columbia, Tennessee, and I love to listen to the Virtual Bible Study. A streaming Bible study. Why didn't I think of that? Now back to the guys. All right, we're back on the program tonight. we got Kent Bailey and Bob Robertson from uh, Tennessee, East Tennessee and uh, Georgia on the line here talking about the instrumental music question. Should Pretty. we? Could we? Are we authorized to use instrumental music in a worship today? Talk about how neat technology is. We can have a Bible study spanning uh, all this geographical area, and we're right, we're right together discussing the Word of God. Thanks, what's, thanks for, what's for joining us. is we could figure out how to make it work. Yeah, <laughs> and it was looking as shaky there a yeah. few minutes before yeah. we started. All right. Kent, uh, we're going to go to you now for uh, 10 minutes uh, to answer some of Bob's arguments. Kent, go ahead. Okay, thank you. And, Bob, I do appreciate your willingness to participate with us. You're a gentleman, appreciate your attitude that you've thus, thus far displayed in our discussion. In response to your material, you raise an interesting question, how do we decide what is authoritative? And uh, if y'all will put my chart number two back up, that answers Bob's question. Colossians chapter three and verse 17, whatever we do in word or deed, we all do in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Christ has expressed his will by means of New Testament revelation. And when we properly use New Testament revelation, when we reason correctly from it, we will draw a proper conclusion from it. Now, he mentioned several divisions among churches of Christ, and I do not deny that they're there. Obviously, they're there. But uh, these divisions oftentimes are built upon the fact that people do not know how to ascertain Bible authority. And if people would understand the concept that the New Testament is our sole source of authority, if they would see the importance of implications and examples and direct statements that are inclusive of commands, we could go a long way in eliminating that division. And not only could we go a long way in eliminating that division, we could go a long way in eliminating division in the religious world as a whole. Bob mentioned the Old Testament, and he was right. We're not under the Old Testament. Galatians 3, Colossians 2, Hebrews chapter 7 tells us we're not. And I certainly recognize the fact that the Old Testament did authorize the use of mechanical instruments of music. Now, I know some of my brethren won't agree with me on that. And, Bob, you're right on that as far as the Old Testament mechanical instruments of music. I believe the Jew in the Old Testament had the right to use mechanical instruments of music. And certainly Psalm 150 uh, points that out. And we go to passages such as the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, and Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. And not only did God authorize the instrument there, the instruments there, he authorized them by specific authority. God spelled out exactly the kind of mechanical instruments of music he wanted. Now, Bob made a mention of Revelation. I wouldn't go to the book of Revelation and try to prove anything but figurative language, at least uh, in a direct way. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. This verse tells us that there's much imagery, there's much sign language, there's much language that's signified that we don't take in a literal fashion. And while we're on that subject, let's turn over to Revelation chapter 14. We find in Revelation chapter 14 that... Uh, John wrote these words, beginning in verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion with him, and a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. Question, did John hear a voice, or did John hear water running? Did John hear voices, or a voice, or did he hear, did he hear thunder? And he said, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Did John hear actual material mechanical instruments of music, harps? Or was, was he using language that's figurative here, just like the water is figurative, and just like the thunder is figurative? Is he not saying that the voices were so well-tuned that those voices were as well-tuned as if they were harpers harping with their harps? There's a lot of figurative language in the book of Revelation. So I don't believe we can prove that there's going to be mechanical instruments of music in heaven by appealing to the book of Revelation. Now, think about this. Uh, prayers are referred to as being bowls of incense, and there's animals that's referred to as being in heaven. We're not going to take that literal, are we? We certainly recognize the figurative language there. And as far as uh, 
the Greek terms that are used, I certainly realize and I recognize those terms that Bob used. I studied Greek as well. In fact, Bob, you probably didn't know this, but my Greek professor got his master's degree from the very same school you went to, Emmanuel School of Religion, and he was a good teacher. But he also taught us something that was very important, and that was in the usage of, of lexicons. And he pointed out, and at least he gave at least credence to this view and gave agreement to the view that something did not have to be explicitly condemned before it was wrong. He pointed out that a word in its definition had to be determined by the usage of its definition in the context in which it was used. And so I will grant that the word solo can mean to twitch, twang, and pluck. It can mean to pull back the strings of, of a bow, but I don't think any of us would believe that that author, authorizes archery in a worship service. Uh, minutes, it could mean twitch, twang, or pluck. How What was the time element on five, that? Five minutes. Five minutes, good. I've got plenty of time. The word pluck, it could mean you know plucking the hair. Now, you know, people have been pulling hair for a long time. But I don't think any of us here tonight would say that authorizes hair pulling as an act of worship. Though some people may act like it, certainly it does not authorize it. And when you look at these lexicons, I didn't use Vine. Uh, I did use Thayer, Analytical Greek Lexicon, Moulton and Milligan, Green, Abbott, Smith, and the Exegetical Dictionary of the New Testament. But those lexicographers did draw singing in contradistinction to other meanings and other definitions of that word. And so when a definition is used in contradistinction to other definitions, the, the, Thayer, the lexicon, whether it be Thayer's, Green's, Abbott, Smith, or Exegetical Dictionary, or any of them, uh, Art and Gingrich, any of those, the, the actual definition is going to apply in the context in which the, way is, the word is used. And obviously Thayer says in the New Testament, in the context it's used in the New Testament, it means to sing. Now, it doesn't say sing only. I grant that, Bob. And you're exactly right on that. However, when you understand the nature, the philosophy of language, of specific language, specific language is exclusive in nature. And no, that's right. You could go to a, a concert in a concert hall, and someone may be invited to come up on the stage and sing a song. That wouldn't necessarily mean they wouldn't use a mechanical instrument of music. But there's a presupposition there that in secular music, instrumental music's fine. But we need to find that presupposition in New Testament authority. And folks, it's simply not there. He hasn't provided it being there. And Bob's an intelligent man. It's not because he lacks the capacity or the ability of the intelligence. He has some very impressive academic records, uh, credentials. And Bob, I do appreciate that. I believe you're a highly intelligent man. But you can labor all you want to tonight, and as long as you want to, you still will not produce, produce a statement, an implication, or example in Greek or in English that produces where uh, a verse of Scripture dealing with a type of music God has authorized is inclusive of mechanical instruments of music and worship. How much time do I have? You have two minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, I'd, li I'd like to ask Bob just a few questions. I'd appreciate if he'd respond to them. Question number one. Which of the following practices, of any, do you oppose if offered to God as acts of worship? What about burning incense? What about counting rosary beads? What about religious dancing? What about handling snakes? And what about using cinnamon toast and orange juice in the Lord's Supper? Did you know none of these are explicitly forbidden in the New Testament? And so, Bob, if you oppose any of these foregoing items in worship, please state upon what scriptural basis that you would do so. Oh, does he want to respond now, Jay? Yeah, yeah, Bob, if you, I guess he would like you to oh, respond. Oh, do you want me to respond yeah, now, yes. Ken? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and respond now. I think the argument would be this. I believe that we're authorized to do anything that God doesn't specifically prohibit us from doing as long as it does not violate a specific command or example in Scripture. Uh, so answering just part of your question, I guess, there isn't any doubt that the Passover feast that Jesus instituted there in the Gospels before he was crucified included unleavened bread and wine. That's a specific example of what was used. I believe in that circumstance, we should use unleavened bread and wine or fruit of the vine. I know most people use unintoxicating uh, wine or 
grape juice, and that's okay too, I think. It's still a fruit of the vine. Uh, so, no, I would not use cinnamon toast or anything else because that would violate a specific example that Jesus used to tell us what the Lord's Supper, what his supper was going to be. And I don't know that I remember all the other things you mentioned. Okay. I, I, I mentioned burning thinking. incense yeah. and counting rosary beads and religious dancing, handling snakes. None of these actually would be morally wrong. None of these would be morally wrong. None of these would violate moral teaching of the Bible. But yet, I can take the scriptures, and on the same basis that you would oppose using cinnamon toast and orange juice in the Lord's Supper, I can make the same argument in opposing use of mechanical instruments of music and worship. It doesn't specifically forbid them. I grant that. I certainly would uh, agree with that. But it does not authorize them. It doesn't authorize them generally, because the Lord didn't just say make music. He said sing. And because this is not authorized specifically, specific language is exclusive in nature. And the same thing that rules out burning incense, the same thing that rules out counting rosary beads or religious dancing or handling snakes. And as you've pointed out, uh, the same thing that would exclude the use of cinnamon toast and orange juice would also be exclusive regarding the type of of music that's unauthorized, which would be mechanical instruments of music. We've that's to, how I would respond to that. We've got to call time on that, Kent. And uh, so, Bob, are, if you're prepared, uh, we'll go ahead and start your time now. Thank you. And, Kent, I appreciate you as well. I appreciate your demeanor. I appreciate the way you've come across this. I would love to find some time, if there's any way for us to do it long distance, to study uh, this ourselves and maybe make time where we're not limited by a a clock like we are here tonight. Be happy to do so, Bob. Thank you. Uh, and I would argue, of course, in response, that I believe the Greek words, and I believe this is supported by most all of the lexicons, includes with it the idea of having an instrument. If you'd put up my slide 48, and I'm not going to read all of these, but I've got larger slides and other slides. And this covers many of them. Some you referenced, Kent, some you did not. But the general understanding of the scholars, and I'm not a Greek scholar. Uh, I did good to pass Greek, okay? Same and here I, for me. I rely upon those who, who know much more than I do. And so I go to these lexicons, and I look at them, and I read them. And almost all of them include the idea that in the time of the New Testament, the words Paul uses all included with them the option at least to play an instrument while you were singing. Now, if that's true, and let me just presume for a moment that that is true, that at the New Testament time, the words translated in Ephesians and Colossians, for example, seen, included in the Greek word the idea that you could sing with or without an instrument. If that's what those words mean, Kent, then the authority you're looking for is included in those words. And seeing doesn't just mean seen, just like we've talked about as you did, um, even in our English language, if we talk about someone singing, unless you say sing a cappella, there isn't any requirement that a person sing without playing an instrument. And yes, that may be something in the secular world that's understood, but the words used by Paul are words that were from the secular world. He didn't make up words generally speaking, I, there are a few maybe he did, but he didn't make up most of the words he wrote with just to apply specifically to church people. He used the common language of his day. And when he used those words that were translated song or sing, the meaning in the first century was with or without an instrument. And if that's what they meant, then the authority you're looking for, Kent, is included in those words. Although our English Bibles may say seen and doesn't say with or without an instrument, I believe we have to go back and look at the Greek to determine how do we understand that word. And if we understand it the way the Greeks did, then my position is there is the authority to sing with an instrument. Uh, you referenced over to, to Revelation, and I agree with you, there's a lot in the book of Revelation that's figurative. And we can't read that book and automatically presume that everything that's in it is specific and apply it across the board. And But even if you ignore that, and even if I give you uh, your position that what's John talking about is, does it sound like harps or was it a, a figurative harp player, or trumpet blower or something? 
Uh, the point is, John uses the same words that Paul used, and they're writing to the same churches. And it's hard for me to imagine that when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, that the church there at Ephesus got his letter and read that and said, oh, well, he means sing a cappella only, uh, which, of course, again, is not there. Uh, they would have understood those words translated into English as sing, as sing with or without an instrument. And so when John goes over and writes the book of Revelation, whether it's literal or figurative, he uses the exact same words that Paul uses. And in John's writings, there are sounds of harps or even harp playing, if you want to read it that way. And I, I agree, you could read it either way. But there are trumpets blowing. And there is harps sound and they're using the same words. And so my position isn't necessarily that there really are harps of gold in the in Revelation or in the Bible or in the heavens. But John uses the same words and no one seems to be amazed or shocked uh, that their harps playing in those words. And so I believe the authority that you're looking for, Kent, is included in the Greek words that we have. And the fact is that they are not translated seeing with or without an instrument makes all the sense in the world to me because that's what those words meant just like in english today if i ask you to sing a song don't ask me to sing one uh, but if i were to ask you to sing one and you could sing it uh, whether you sang with or without an instrument wouldn't make any difference you're still honoring my request that we sing uh, you referenced hebrews chapter 2 verse 12 Five and five. Thank you. Uh, that passage, by the way, is not just a statement by the writer of the book of Hebrews. It's actually a uh, quote from a psalm, which is a psalm of David, including instruments. And so when the Hebrew writer says, say, and I will declare their name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise to you, that's a quote from Psalm 22, a psalm of David written to his chief musician, and which was set, according to the people who have looked this up, to a specific tune. And so the, the Hebrew writer isn't even saying, I don't believe, sing a cappella only praise. But he's rather using the same words that references back to David's psalm, where instruments clearly were used. And so again, if we look at it that way, and I agree people differ on how they want to look at that, uh, but if we take the Greek words for what they really meant in the first century, then that is the authority that you're asking me to come up with because those words authorize that. And I believe that's important for us to look at. And that's why I think it's important for us to study and why I believe in order to truly understand Scripture in detail like we're talking about tonight, we need to have some understanding of the Greek and some understanding of the world in which Jesus walked and Paul and John and the others wrote. Not to say you got to be a scholar in that in order to come to Jesus, because I don't think that's true. But I do believe when we get to some of these nuances and things that seem to split churches, uh, that if we don't have some understanding of what was going on back in the first century, we're stuck trying to determine first century ideas with 21st century eyes, uh, which isn't always easy to do. Uh, and as we look at the Old Testament, and we can start by the time they leave Egypt, the Jewish people, and walk across the Red Sea, or under through the Red Sea, uh, Miriam sings, they praise to God. There's examples of David praising songs, and as you mentioned, uh, Kent, and I agree, there's differences of opinion on this as well from some of our brethren. I clearly believe the Bible in the Old Testament authorizes music. When we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, that's still under the Old Testament law, at least until the last few chapters. Those Jews worshipped in the synagogue. They went to the temples. They did things like the Jewish people did where instruments were playing. And as we read the book of Acts, those early Christians, most of whom were Jewish, uh, continued to, at times, go to the synagogues and go to the temples and worship there. It, it, Paul or Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. Uh, they didn't stop going to the temple or stop going to synagogues uh, simply because there were instruments playing or might come across some instrument. And so as we read through those, uh, and I'm looking for the authority that you're asking us to come up with, one argument is the Greek idea. Second is the I things that the Old Testament doesn't want us to do anymore, such as animal sacrifice, 
uh, going to Jerusalem every year for the Passover. And there are specific commands in Scripture that tells us that's not authorized anymore. Two minutes. Jesus Two minutes. is our sacrifice. I don't need an animal sacrifice. Uh, I don't have to honor certain Jewish holy days because Paul writes and says we don't have to do that anymore. But there is absolutely nothing in the New Testament that tells us stop singing with instruments. And considering how that was the practice in the early church, at least as far as the Jews were concerned, in their Jewish practice, that would have been well known to the people of Paul's day, uh, and nothing ever said, don't do that. Uh, and Bob, again, you heard me. We got one, you've got one minute now. I'm sorry. Thank you. I didn't, but thank you for emphasizing that. Um, the fact that they're using those Greek words that author aid, and nowhere is there something to say, well, it doesn't really mean that anymore. You can't do that anymore. Uh, my position is we have authority in the New Testament to use instruments as we wish uh, or not. And that's part of the freedom, again, that we have in Jesus. And I have absolutely no objection to anyone singing a cappella if that's what they want to do. But I also believe Christians have the freedom to sing accompanied by instruments if that's what they wish to do. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Bob. All right. We've all right. got a few minutes. Not much time here. Uh, you guys, you've done a great job presenting your case. I really appreciate it. It's obvious that you've spent a good bit of time in preparation, and we appreciate that so much. Uh, i got a question I'd like to direct to you. Uh, I had a question came in from one of our listeners while you were speaking, uh, Bob, uh, and he's, he makes a, a point that I've heard made before. Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, those verses specify that the melody, the solo, the making of melody, the, or therefore the plucking or twanging, is to be done on the heart. That is on the heart strings, not on a musical instrument. How would you respond to that? Two ways I respond to that, because I've had that question asked before and have done my best to try to look up an answer for that. Uh, some of our early uh, Christian brethren argued that sing and make melody in the heart goes together. It's a conjunctive uh, and everything has to be in the heart. And if you study the church history, there was a period of time when people thought singing was to be silent. You had to only sing in your heart. And we've we pretty well quashed that idea. But when Kent cites to us John chapter 4, it says, we worship in spirit and in truth. That's what I believe Paul is talking about. You can sing church songs all day long, but if you're not singing in your heart, if the music's not coming from your heart, you're not really praising God. And so I believe what Paul is saying is if you're going to praise God, you've got to do it intentionally. Okay. You can't just sing a song that doesn't have something to do with your heart being connected to it. Bob, I have a question. You mentioned that uh, the word indicates that uh, instrumental music would be optional. You could sing or sing and play. Could you play only? Uh, and for instance, uh, maybe during the Lord's Supper, could you just have an instrumental solo? Is that acceptable? I'm going to leave that up to people's decision, but I think you have to sing. And, you know, the question is, okay, could we then have someone just playing a piano while the Lord's Supper emblems are being passed around? I've not really given that a whole lot of thought, to be honest with you, but I do agree that the command is seen. And so if you went to worship service and just only played the piano and there was no singing, I think that'd be wrong. Bob, um it's my understanding, you can correct me if your understanding is different, my understanding that there was a, a, a notable break from Old Testament law of Moses practice in the synagogue and in the temple where instruments of music were commonly employed. Every church historian that I've ever read after says that in the earliest centuries of the New Testament church, Christians did not use instrumental music accompaniment with their singing. So as you pointed out, there was common practice among the Jews to use instruments, but church historians say that there was a, a, an obvious break with that practice and that it was several centuries later when instruments began to be introduced into Christian worship. Is uh, uh, Now, the reason I'm making that point is we're, we're, most of our discussion tonight has centered on the Greek words and their meaning. Those people knew the Greek. That was, they used it as a native tongue. And so if, if, 
playing of instruments inherent in the word solo, then they would have known that. And 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 my my question to you is why do we not see that historically that they engaged in that practice? They knew the they knew the meaning and the and the current usage of the terminology, and they did not. Historians say they did not employ musical instruments. My answer, and I see we're almost out of time. I don't know how long we'll go tonight. I'm willing to go as long as you want. A um, couple answers to that. One, people didn't have access to musical instruments then the way we have today. You couldn't just go down to the store and buy a trombone or go to the store and buy a piano or go to the store and buy a harp. Those things were extremely rare, and the average common person simply couldn't afford them. And of course, as we study, you know, go through Acts in the early church, many, many, many of the early Christians were on the poor side. They they probably couldn't go buy those instruments, even if they had wanted to. But if you flip that a little bit and realize that the first two or three centuries, actually three or four centuries, I guess, of the church were being persecuted tremendously. Most Christians didn't want to draw attention to themselves by being loud and boisterous to where if someone's going to come kick their doors down, uh, they were hiding in the catacombs and place like, places like that. And so it may very well be that they didn't use instruments, and we don't know for sure that they did not. It may not be referenced, and you're right, it's about, I think, 199 before we actually have a reference to an instrument being played, but that's not that far down the road. It may also simply be that that wasn't an issue for the early church. And whether they had an instrument or didn't have an instrument, they didn't write about it because it didn't matter to them. Okay. We've, made it an, we've made it an issue. Thank you. Question for you, Kent, real quick. We're out of time. We're going to have to draw it to a close. But Kent, uh, Bob said that when we move from the Old Testament law of Moses to the New Testament law of Christ, that he made a, he made a suggestion that we're told what not to do anymore. Uh, uh, I wonder if you agree with that. I, I, I would specifically maybe reference the question you asked about burning of incense. Uh, no, I agree with Bob on that. In fact, when you understand this nature, again, the philosophy of language and the explicit statements and uh, statements that are, are uh, very clear, uh, statements that we would call specific statements and specific authority, you don't have to have an explicit condemnation for something that's not authorized. Okay. And I don't believe you can take the position, uh, at least from my study of the scriptures, that everything that uh, God did not want carried over from the Old Testament was explicitly condemned or explicitly forbidden. If, it's, if something is not authorized, you don't have to explicitly t tell somebody not to do something that's not explicitly authorized. If I'm going up Interstate 81 to Washington, D.C., I don't take every exit between Johnson City and Washington, D.C., simply because the exit sign does not have an explicit prohibition for me to take it. If I travel the way some people read the Bible, I'd never get out of the Tri-Cities, much less into Virginia. And I certainly wouldn't make it to the Shenandoah Valley, and I know I wouldn't make it to Washington, D.C. And so I maintain that uh, things in the New Testament, as there was that transition period, I don't think you necessarily have to find an explicit prohibition from something in the old law before something was unauthorized in the new covenant of Christ. All right, thank you. We're out of time, guys. We are. Why don't we give the gentleman... Yeah, uh, let, let's give, give, give you about 30 minutes. seconds to make a final statement. Start with you, Kent. Okay, I'll give you my email address. It's kbailey385 at aol.com. kbailey385 at aol.com. My phone number, cell number is 706 629 6111 and again, it all gets, this is a hermeneutical question. I think Bob and I would agree on that. It's a matter of hermeneutics, and it's a matter of authority, and we have to go by a sound biblical system of hermeneutics and logical, rational, critical thinking in order to look at the Bible and draw proper conclusions from it. Thank you, Kent. Uh, Bob? And I, again, just if you'd put my slide one up there and let people see my email address and phone number, uh, they're welcome to contact me. And I'd be glad to respond to an email or respond to a telephone call uh, to talk about this some more. Uh, and I agree, Kent, this is a matter of authority. It's a matter of, you know, what does the Bible allow me to do? Just through my studies, I believe those words allow me, if I wish, to have an instrument. Uh, I don't have to, but I can if I want to. And I think that's the major difference is the way we see those Greek words 
and how they're translated for us. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Kent, thank I appreciate discussing yeah. this with you. Th thank you, thank guys. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, appreciate uh, your attitude. Yeah, thank you, thank you both. Um, a very important uh, discussion. And it's so important that we can have both views presented and that we can discuss our differences. Uh, uh, th that, that's and we appreciate today. the tone and the demeanor yeah, of both of you tonight. Yes, absolutely. It's been a very good uh, discussion. Th thanks again. Hang on, guys. We'll talk to you just as we get off the air here. We're going to wrap this up. Kyle, you've been uh, on the other side of the, the yeah, board yeah. there tonight, uh, making things happen. Uh, any comments from you? No, it was a good study. I appreciate both of you. All right. Dad, uh, again, we welcome our listeners to contact us as well if they'd like sure. to talk about this. Program. Sure, exactly. Questions and and you can also com. do some searching on our archives. There's some there's some past programs on this question in our archives. We also we spoke with a, well, a Baptist preacher about this many, many years ago, probably yeah. getting close to 10 years ago now yeah. or more. Uh, you might check that out in the archives if you want to further study on that, uh, but a very important discussion tonight. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks to Bob again and Kent again for their time and their preparation. Thank you for listening and being part of the program tonight. We hope you benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word. Hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. And in the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.